Hi, everybody. Welcome to, I could hear you. I was like, I should probably let Rebecca finish the hallway because <laughs> I can like hear it as our hold screen is up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast Club episode 51. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome back my friend and our head librarian, Rebecca Kim. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Um, I get so excited when you're going to be on this show because you are such a good researcher and such a good brain and you have such good stories. And I know that the one you're telling today is one you've wanted to do for a little while or for a long while. Um, so will you give us a sense of who we're meeting today? Yeah, this is Toshio Osada. You can see his photo. Um, he is, I don't know, he's so many things. He's a scientist, an artist, a photographer, um, an exhibit curator, and he has this long windy history with the Academy. Um, and in the archives, there's always like um, people that you get fascinated with because there's not a lot of information about them. And Toshio Asada is one of them. We have his paintings and he worked at the Academy, but we don't have a whole lot of other um, uh, information about him. And so he's been always kind of a mystery. So this has been an amazing project for me, uh, doing a deep dive into his life. And science has done such a terrible job of remembering and protecting the stories of people who aren't white and who aren't yeah. clergy male. Um, and yeah, so this is, and today being the, the American Day of Remembrance, it's a perfect day to dig into his story um, for reasons that are less beautiful than his incredible illustrations. But um, I'm gonna let you get started and give you the deck. And I will remember, sorry, remind people, so here's that, that if you're watching, you can ask Rebecca questions anytime at all. You can leave them in the comment section on Facebook um, or the chat box on YouTube, and I'll loop back and ask them at the end. And with that, Rebecca, thanks again. I'll get out of here and see you at the end. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Laurel. All right, let's get started. So um, I'm just going to start off because um, we picked this day specifically because it's the remembrance of the day that... Um, the Executive Order 9066 was signed um, by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, it was today, 79 years ago. And this order authorized the Secretary of War to prescribe certain areas as military zones, pretty much clearing the way for the incarceration of some 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast. Um, and one of these people's and is Toshio Asada, he ends up going to an internment camp, which I'll talk about later. But I also wanted to take this time to recognize um, two staff members who were not staff at the time, but who um, whose life were in, whose lives were impacted by this order. Um, the academy itself has no specific response to the order. They do respond to the Americans entering the war by creating a policy for staff who enlisted and halting some expansion projects. Um, and then also creating an optical repair shop in the museum that um, service optical and navigation instruments. But nothing specific about um, this particular order, probably because there wasn't anyone on staff that was impacted. So I wanted to talk just a teeny bit before I do a deep dive into Toshio um, about Pearl Sonata, who was the senior curatorial assistant in theology from 1967 to 1995. Um, at the time of the order, she was attending college and had to drop out mid-semester and make her way home. Her father was arrested by the FBI and was interred separately from her family. Um, and her mother had to sell their home, ranch, and all their personal belongings in less than a week. Um, and they were all sent, the, her mother and her sisters were all sent to Boston internment camp in Arizona. Pearl passed away in 2015, but throughout her life, she found the experience so traumatic, she did not speak much about it. Um, and the other person is Tomio Iwamoto, who it was the curator of ichthyology from 1972 to, uh, to 2011. And he's currently the curator of ichthyology emeritus. He was three years old when his family was removed from their home in Los Angeles and moved to Heart Mountain Internment Camp in Wyoming. Uh, his younger brother was born in the camp in 1943, and they were there until 1945. Um, so, and these are just two people that I know of that were impacted, that had worked at the academy, um, and they just both happened to work in the theology, and both happened to work together at some point in time. So there's a photo of Pearl on the left and Tomio on the right, a more recent photo of Tomio, and the two of them working together in the theology department. Okay, so on to Toshio. 
I, um, Toshio Sada was a scientist, artist, photographer. Um, he did so many things in his life. And he has this sort of long running relationship with the academy where he, um, and so from the time he pretty much moves to America. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about his early life. Um, he was born in Tokyo uh, on December 9th, 1893. We don't know the names of his parents, but we do know he has two brothers and two sisters and was his second or third child. Um, his mother died when he was young and he did live with his uncles in Tokyo um, for a few months. Another inter an interesting fact about Hoshio is he's of samurai descent and comes from a pretty well-off family. He spent um, part of his childhood in the Gunma Prefecture near Mount Miyogi, which is that picture on the uh, recent photo on the left. Um, and I think this is sort of what develops his sort of passion and love for nature. And then, um, and he graduates from Azubu Junior High School in Tokyo in 1911, which is basically high school. So he's 18. And then the photo on the right is, um, would be Tokyo around the time that Toshio was um, born. So just to give a sense of history. Um, and then he goes on to work as a teacher at a high, um, at a high school in Goma Prefecture for two years. And then two years after that, from 1914 to 1916, he kind of takes like a gap year and travels around Japan on a kind of personal research trip. Um, and on the on these travels, he meets um, Shigeo Yamanuchi um, in, in a prefecture south of Tokyo, which there is a photo of that sort of area on the left. And there's Shigeo Yamanuchi on the right, a photo of him. And this chance meeting probably changes the course of Toshio's life. Um, the, Shigeo describes um, Toshio in one of his writings. He, this is a quote from his book. In the morning and evenings, he, Toshio Osada, was moving agilely around the shore, swimming, rowing, and jumping, gathering rocks, shells, and seaweed, and was busy preparing watercolor paintings and sceneries of landscapes. But as long as I could see during my stay here, he seemed sincerely interested in his hobby. And if anyone who came or went asked questions, he answered them in a friendly way without showing any taste for people. I was given a deep impression that he really was really a nature lover. And I do think that probably sums up Toshio's personality in some ways. Um, in 1916, he enrolls in Tokyo Higher Normal School, which is a university. And it's no coincidence that Yamanuchi was a professor there of plants and biology and also the head of the biology department. Um, and during this time in college, he starts to experiment with photography. And then he graduates four years later in 1920 and he teaches geography at his old high school. Um, he moves to the United States in March of 1923. He's 29 at this point. And he, moved, um, he plans on enroll, enrolling in the University of Chicago for graduate studies. He's most likely following his mentor, Shigeo Yamanuchi, who was, who was a professor there and had earned his PhD in botany in 1907 and had some affiliation still with the university. Um, so, and then Toshio also, right before he moves to the United States, uh, writes a book called Mountain Climbing as a Hobby for Walkers. And it's published in Japan in 1923, uh, in June of 1923. Unfortunately, um, in September, on September 1st, 1923 is when the Great Kanto earthquake happens. Um, there's varied accounts about the duration, but it, it was either between four and 10 minutes. And there were extensive firestorms and even a fire tornado that added to the death toll. It was considered, uh, it was a 7.9 magnitude earthquake. And you can see some photos of the destruction of the aftermath afterwards. Um, this totally changes Toshio's plans for furthering his education. He no longer has access to, I think his family funds. And then he was hoping to rely on some royalties from his book publication. And those um, that totally dries up because the publisher goes bankrupt due to the earthquake. Um, so he moves to New York in 1924. Um, and he, 
And we know he briefly works at a coffee shop and then gets a job at James L. Clark Studios. He also like spent some time at the YMCA in New York trying to learn English. Um, so he works at James L. Clark Studios for five years until 1929. And a little bit about James L. Clark. He was an explorer, sculptor, and taxidermist. He's well known for his work on the dioramas at the American Museum of Natural History. He oversaw the construction of um, the diorama halls, the Fernet Asiatic Hall, the Akeley African Hall, and the Birds of the World, mm -hmm. and Ocean Life Halls during the 1920s. So he was very involved in like creating those dioramas. And um, Toshio credits Clark with um, teaching him the art of taxidermy. So, which is a skill that comes in very handy later on in it. Well, actually for most of his life. Um, he also is still um, taking photographs. And in 1929, he's awarded um, the first prize in a nature study um, category that was in a, con a photo contest by Eastman Kodak for amateur photographers. And it's in the category of nature study. So there you can see on the right is, a f is the photo that won him that award. And there was a cash prize of $500, which probably was pretty great. Um, and then there's a photo of James L. Clark on the left, as you can see, he as he's creating a mount for one of the halls. Um, so he um, moves west, um, probably around 1930, um, at least by 1930. He works as a technician for natural color photo print studios here in San Francisco. Um, but it does seem like he came out to California previously, uh, definitely in 1927, he had, or he had already had some contact with the Academy and had uh, made ich, um, some specimen paintings for uh, ichthyologist David Starr Jordan, who was the president of Stanford University and an Academy board member, and for ichthyologist Barton Warren Everman, who later becomes director of the Academy and is an ichthyologist at the Academy. So you can see on the left, um, these that's a, a plate or a page from a publication called Notes on New or Rare Fishes from Hawaii that was um, published by Jordan Everman and Tanaka in 1927. And on the right is the um, original from his, the, um, a, from his collection. So just kind of a little bit more details and with his notes on the bottom. Um, so you can see his craftsmanship or artistry is already sort of very spot on at this point. The next step in his life, he um, meets Zane Gray in, he, um, in 1931, and he travels with him on his yacht. A little bit about Zane Gray, he's a dentist who becomes an American author known for his popular Western novels. His best-selling book was Riders of the Purple Sage. You can see the cover in the middle. He was also an avid fisherman. You can see the photo on the right is this same gray with this huge sunfish from 1926. Um, yeah, so he um, so he has a he has a boat and he leaves San Francisco in December 1930, um, and he returns seven months later. And they went to Manaway, um, or well, let's see. The first half of the trip was to Tahiti, and the second half. Um, was the return home. They visited French Polynesia, Tonga, Fiji, and Nui. Um, it, what, it doesn't sound like the trip was exactly what St. Gray had envisioned, um, nor maybe what Toshio had envisioned. Um, so shortly afterwards, Toshio meets Templeton Crocker and um, asks him for a job on, his, on Crocker's next expedition. He comes with recommendation letters from David Starr Jordan um, and Barton Warren Everman, who's the director of the Academy, um, and also who is coordinating with Crocker an expedition for 19, um, to the Galapagos in 1932. So it seems like these letters were effective because Crocker does hire Toshio as his photographer and artist and filmmaker um, for his next expedition, which is, in, uh, is to the Galapagos with the Academy in 1932. Um, and a little bit of Charles Templeton Crocker. He is a self-proclaimed explorer. He sailed his yacht Zaka around the world covering 27,000 miles. 
and he visited 50 ports in 1930. So right before he meets Toshio. And he has this, um, in order to do that, he had a custom built boat, which is the Zaka, and it's the Native American word for peace. Um, he, uh, so a little bit about his background, he's the grandson of Charles Crocker, who is one of the big four who built the Central Pacific Railroad. Um, and his, um, and Charles Crocker, his grandfather was an uh, early member of the Academy and a, and a big time donor as well. His father, Frederick Crocker, had been the president of the board of the Academy. So Templeton Crocker also has this kind of long history with the Academy. Um, so he has a very luxurious life. He inherited $5 million in 1905. In today's dollars, that would be $150 million. And then later on um, receives an additional inheritance from his uncle. So he decides to just live a bohemian lifestyle and travel around the world. So the very first expedition that um, Toshio goes on with Crocker is the 1932 Galapagos expedition. And this expedition is the one that is, um, that's with the Academy. Um, and it's, it's for five months, two months in the Galapagos. It, um, they leave March 10th and return September 1st, 1932. They make st stops along the way to collect materials and Toshio Osada is considered the first person from Japan to be part of an expedition on the Galapagos. So for the Academy, this expedition was just to fill in um, the Academy's collection from their last expedition, which was in 1906. Um, so there wasn't the same kind of focus when they first went or went earlier in 1906 to collect as much as they could. It was really to just kind of fill in some of the gaps. Also, this trip was a bit more luxurious there was like a dinner hour some of i've seen an account where one of the scientists complains about having to come back to the boat for dinner like a formal dinner um so and they um on this trip as well something different is they collected live specimens um to bring back to the aquarium to display in the aquarium um so they brought back 331 live specimens for steinhardt aquarium exhibits um, they collected some materials from her for herpetology. A few, it seems like a few snakes, um, but not a lot. And they also collected paleontology fossils, uh, marine shells, four hundred specimens of birds um, to fill out the existing collection. Um, about four thousand botanical specimens and twenty four hundred insects, mostly focusing on true bugs and flies, which were sort of overlooked in the earlier expedition. So um, here's uh, some photos of, uh, sorry, I should talk about the photos a little bit. <laughs> There's a photo of Zaka on the left. And then on the right is a crew. It's hard to see, it's not a great photo, but you can see Toshio on the bottom right. And then um, JT Howell's like maybe in the back row, second to the right. Um, and then I think Crocker's in the middle, but it's hard to tell with that photo. Um, but here's a better photo of the three of those people. Toshi Osada is on the left with a giant cactus. J.T. Howell is in the middle who becomes the curator of botany at the Academy and has a long history as well. Um, and then there's um, Temple to Crocker on the right, um, posing with a, a shark jaw. <laughs> Um, but there are other um, people who are on the uh, other scientists who, who are on this um, expedition. Harry Jaceworth, who's the ornithologist, Robert Lanier, who's the assistant superintendent of the uh, Steinhardt Aquarium, um, H. Walton Clark, who's the assistant curator of ichthyology, um, J.T. Howell, I mentioned, he's actually at the time assistant curator of botany, Alice Eastwood is the senior curator of botany. And then Maurice Willows, who is um, Templeton Crocker's personal secretary, is um, assigned to be the entomology assistant and collect all the um, all the entomology specimens. And then Toshio Osada's role on all these expeditions is artist, photographer, taxidermist, and so much more. Um, he so there's not a lot of photographs of him because he's pretty much taken all the photographs. And he also, I think, takes some of the movies and um, and creates these amazing watercolors, which I'll show in a second. And yeah, and also, yeah. So he does pretty much everything and anything. 
So here's a photo of Toshio Osada's, um, it's a red tail triggerfish. It's a watercolor he's done on the left. And then on the right is a photograph of the actual uh, fish. And you can see how close they are. Um, and you can also see these watercolors are not just beautiful, but they serve a scientific purpose. At the time, there was only black and white photography. So um, it would have been hard to see any of these, um, pic these pigments in a photo. And so by the, making these watercolors, he's able to capture the vividness of these fishes while they're still alive. And then once they're preserved, they lose all their color. So they're, um, so this would be the only way to preserve, like to show what they look like. Um, and here's another fish. It's a Pacific beak fish, the same. You can see how close he, like how very close he is to the real thing. Um, he not only made watercolors of fishes, he also did some, he did some lizards, any sort of, they're mostly fishes and marine organisms, but he did some others as well. So there's some lizards on the left and some squids from the Galapagos Islands on the right. And then he, and I hadn't known this until I started working on this talk, but he also did, he did these illustrations of birds. So you can see there's a start of a sketch of a penguin that's starting to get filled in, but not completed. Um, and it's from Isabella Island. And then you can see a flamingo head um, from Charles Island. Um, and then not only, I mean, we often remember Toshio Asada as an artist, but we tend to overlook his work as a scientist and collector. Um, you know, he did have an educational background in the, in the sciences and so he just had he just happened to be an excellent artist um, and so we can see some of his collecting work here in the academy um, an example is he collected this umbrina zanti which is kind of croaker um, that was collected in 1932 from mazatlan um, and we also have a record of him collecting at least six geckos and skinks from the galapagos and french polynesia and 43 fishes from around Mexico. There are probably more specimens, but um, there are hundreds of specimens from octopi to birds that are attributed to the Templeton Cracker Expedition. And we can probably be certain that Toshio had a hand in um, helping, at, at least helping in collecting those items. So you can see a photo uh, of the fish in the jar uh, and then the, the croaker sort of taken out and photographed and then the one with the blue background on the bottom right is a picture of the fish alive. So it, you can see it doesn't really, um, it doesn't look very lifelike once preserved and also the color sort of fades away. And then the next thing is I wanted to show this. Um, oops, okay, sorry, hold on one second. Uh, I wanted to show this video of Toshi Osada. Um, Okay, I'll play it again. Sorry, I just kind of, um, it's a very short click and we don't, you know, he lives during a time where movies aren't super easy or popular. And so here's just a short clip of him taking the photographs of some of the specimens. And it's from the 1932 Galapagos expedition. There's just something neat about seeing somebody moving around and not just a static image. Okay, so um, he goes on many more expeditions with Crocker, but I did wanna highlight just one other one. It's um, an expedition to Eastern Polynesia that he uh, they went from September 15th, 1934 to April 16th, 1935. And it was um, with the American Museum of Natural History. They stop at Rapa Nui, uh, which is Easter Island and the Galapagos Islands on this trip. And one of the main goals was to create a cast of the Moai statues, which is still, uh, the cast is still on display at the American Museum. Rapa Nui is fairly remote. It's 2000 miles west of the Chilean coast. So the photo on the left is a, the photo of a, the group of them that went on this um, expedition. And you can see Asayada, uh, Toshi Asayada is on the le way left. And then Crocker, Templeton Crocker is in the middle wearing white. And the image on the right is this map drawn by Toshio Asada of the Easter Island quarry. And it, it's 
just meticulous. Um, he meticulously notes where each of the statues are. It's hard to see. Also, it was like pasted in a scrapbook. So those like brown swashes that you see is the remnants of the paste. Um, and he makes more than one uh, map of the island, but he meticulously notes where all the statues are. Um, and so he, um, one of his primary goals was to create a cast and you can, um, for the American Museum. Um, and so Asayata takes on this task. It's pretty laborious. You can see for scale, the photo on the left that um, they're pretty big. Um, and then the image in the middle is the process of um, the cast making. And the image on the right is a sketch of Toshio's of just sort of the dimensions. Um, so the, the moais are, can be pretty tall. The tallest moai erected was about 33 feet high and weighed 82 tons. Um, they're called Easter Island heads for two reasons. First, the heads are disproportionately large. Um, the head to body ratio is three to five. And then second, many moai are buried to the shoulders making them appear only as heads. And you can see that in the sketch that um, he has shown some of how much of the statue is buried underground. So this was no easy task. And here's a description of Toshio making them. He said, um, under a boiling sun and surrounded by a cloud of insects, Toshio Asada labored for days making molds of the figure. The cast was made in sections, each carefully numbered and will be eventually displayed in the museum. And so the middle photograph you can see, you can see there's like numbers of the various pieces of the cast. Um, and then just the interesting fact, the cast is, I said, uh, like I said before, is still on display. It's a part of the American Museum's Hall of Pacific Peoples. And it even makes a film appearance um, in the movie Night at the Museum. The statue, in the movie, the statue is voiced by Brad, Brad Garrett. And its most memorable line is, hey, dum-dum, you give me gum-gum. I just thought it was a neat, uh, neat little fact. And um, anyways, it's nice to see Toshio Zasada's work is appreciated by in so many ways. So lots more expeditions. They go, um, Templeton Crocker a lot, and Toshio Zasada go on a total of eight expeditions over six years. Um, from 1932 to 1938, and they travel much of the South Pacific. Um, Cronker sponsors additional expeditions for the American Museum and also sponsors an expedition for the New York Zoological Society. He often hosted guests on his expeditions, and one of the notable ones on these, on one, on some, one of the notable ones on these trips was William Beebe. William Beebe was an American naturalist, ornithologist, marine biologist, entomologist, explorer, and author, so many things. And at the time, he was probably the most famous naturalist. Um, he wrote science for both a popular and academic audience and was much like Stephen Jay Gould. He admired Toshio, and he even used his photographs in some of his books. And what Beebe says of, um, I'm just going to um, just read a quote from Beeb talking about Toshio Osada. He says, Mr. Crocker's artist, photographer, and taxidermist will always remember for his tireless energy in the able accomplishment of the task he sets for himself. And so you can see a photo on the left is Zaka. Um, and then on the right is just a clipping from a newspaper from um, Hawaii, um, the Hawaii Tribune, just talking about the Zaka landing. Um, and spending some time in Oahu. In the middle of all this, somehow Toshio gets married. He gets married in 1936. Um, he marries Suzuka Tanizaki, um, and we don't know much about her. And this photo of that, a photo of her is the only one that, I, that I've seen. Um, we know she was a seamstress and had a high school education. Um, and we know from her internee records and the records from the Department of Justice that she had been married before and had an adult son in Japan who she had no contact with. Oh, sorry. And this is a card that was sent in 1937, a Christmas card, um, I think. I'm not sure. I don't, um, someone did 
translate the Japanese for me and I kind of forgot. I don't know where I put those notes, but yes, it's a cute photo of the two of them. In 1940, uh, Toshio starts to settle down. He's 47 years old at this time. He's been married. Um, he, um, the expeditions have ended due to the start of World War II. And so he, Toshio opens new Grant Photo Studios in San Francisco. And here um, there's some, um, and you can see these are the advertisements that he put in the newspaper, um, in the local Japanese newspaper, um, both in English and in Japan and, and in Japanese. And it's advertised as the only Japanese color photo studio. Um, we, I mean, we have some of this information we've been able to gather is from his Department of Justice records. And we know he spent about $2,500 to $4,500 opening the studio, which in today's dollars is about $45,000 to $80,000. And this is probably his entire life savings um, being put into opening up this photo studio. Um, when he's interviewed by the Department of Justice later on, he tells them he only has a few dollars left in both his savings and checking account. So he's he spent everything setting up the shop. Um, and and um, this will not to surprise anyone, but he does he doesn't get to keep this photo studio for very long. And just to put things in perspective. Um, in 1988, when Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act and offered a formal apology to all those that were interred, he paid, each survivor got $20,000. So um, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, um, which changes sort of the momentum of the war and, and the American involvement. For Toshio, he immediately comes under suspicion from the FBI. On December 12th, John Edgar Hoover writes a memo asking, um, asking Washington, D.C. for advice about detaining Toshio. That letter is on the right. Um, he, Hoover writes that Toshio is well known in the Japanese community and was even able to obtain a doctor for the Japanese consulate. On December 16th, the Department of Justice receives a call from a W.J. Fletcher from the St. Francis Yacht Club that tells him Toshio was on a scientific expedition in the South Pacific and had made extra copies of maps and sent them to Japan. Fletcher had no, he has no definite, definitive evidence that these copies were sent to Japan, but he believes this based on the, this is a quote, based on the attitude of Toshio toward the crew, treated them like scum, and then he also, um, this is also a quote from the records. He was unable to furnish any description of the subject and stated he looked like every other Japanese. Um, so it's kind of appalling actually. Um, so the US attorney actually ends up issuing a search warrant um, less than a, about a month later on January 31st, 1942. Toshio served a few days later with a warrant at his business, and he offers to walk the officers to his house and walk, them, um, walk to the field office to answer any questions. The details of the interview are in his Department of Justice files, and when they are talking to, when Toshio is talking to the officers, it's clear, he makes it clear that his allegiance is to the United States. He says he only joined the Japanese Association of San Francisco in 1940 because he was threatened if he didn't, his business would be in trouble when it opened. He also states that he has no friends among the Japanese and associated with white people almost exclusively. I have no idea what he's thinking during this time, but I assume he must be very frightened. Um, and, he, and he can probably see like some of the smallest, most innocent gestures like making maps on an expedition can be easily misconstrued and seen as sort of a national threat. Um, so he gives them a list of character references and half of them are Academy staff. The case is closed in June of 1942 because they have no evidence of subversive activity. And he, at that point he had already been evacuated and sent away. So he was no longer considered a threat. On February 19th, 1942, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066. As I said, this order authorized the Secretary of War to basically incarcerate um, 
Americans of Japanese descent, but it also included German Americans and Italian Americans, um, but primarily Japanese Americans. Um, and so again, I'll say it's, it was about, the incarceration was about 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast, who they had to abandon their jobs, their homes, their lives to be sent to one of 10 concentration camps scattered in desolate remote regions of the country. Toshio, along with other Japanese Americans had to abandon his business and moved, and he was moved to Tanafran Assembly Center which is in San Bruno, California. It had been a, had been a, or was a racetrack or, and then after Pearl Harbor, the army took control and it was a place to hold Japanese Americans before moving them to an official internment camp. Um, the average stay was about six months. So it's a temporary holding place. Um, and at this time, uh, like, so that the Tanafran Assembly Center no longer exists, but that it is now the spot that it um, holds is now a mall. It's kind of odd. I had no idea. Um, so, and then like for Toshio, like I don't, we don't really know too much about what he's thinking around this time, but he has a resume and on his resume, he notes about this time period, evacuation from California, closed everything to the duration of the war. He, um, in October 1st, 1942, Toshio and Suzuka, Suzuka are moved to the Topaz internment camp or also called a relocation center. Um, Toshio in his usual wake, he's very busy at Topaz. He teaches an adult geography class and was paid $19 a month while teaching, which is, which is the top tier for those that were paid at the camp. He's profiled for the camp newspaper Topaz Times. He has a few exhibitions of his work, one being an exhibit of his Hawaiian fishes. Um, and it was an exhibit that was put on to welcome new internees from Hawaii. He, he's also still working a painting and draw, uh, I'm not sure about drawing, but he's definitely painting and he's painting scenes from the camp. So on the left, you can see this is a painting from the Springville Museum of Art. Um, and it's a watercolor of the barracks and topaz. And then the um, painting on the right is from the National American National Museum of American History, also another watercolor of topaz. Um, the book, there are a few scattered around here in the United States, but the bulk of these works, 39 paintings are at the National Museum of Ethnology in Japan. We also know that he has some contact still with people in the museum world. The American Museum had contacted Toshio for pots herds that are from the local area. So, um, and those are like pot pottery fragments that may have an archeological significance. Um, and then also at Topaz, there are other famous attorneys, um, Fred Korematsu, who, whose case went to the United States Supreme Court um, is interred at Topaz. There are other photographers as well. Um, maybe the most famous one is David Tatsuno, whose home, he took home movies of Topaz that are included in the National Film Registry. Um, and also like there are other natural nature enthusiasts there. Um, a kind of interesting fact is two attorneys, Akio, I'm really gonna really, Ujihara and Yoshio Nishimoto, um, they found a, like a thousand pound meteorite in the mountains nearby. So I'm hoping that he kept busy and he had good company during this time. Uh, life after the war. On October 14th, 1945, Asayada and his wife were released from the camp. Um, and he sort of bounces around a little bit looking for a job. He worked temporarily for a photo studio in San Francisco in the spring. And then he ends up getting a job at California Institute of Technology in January, 1947. He's 54 at this point in time. Um, he still keeps in contact with members of the Academy. And part of his, as part of his search, he had a letter of recommendation from Robert Miller, who was the executive director of the Academy at the time. And at Caltech, he works for Wyatt Durham. Um, and there's a picture of Wyatt Durham on the right. And there was a picture of Caltech around that time period. 
um, on the left. Um, so for Wyatt Dern, he makes casts, photographs, and catalogs fossils for publication and display. Uh, he starts looking for other employment when Durham leaves in June of 1947, um, and, he, and Durham leaves for a job at Berkeley. Um, Toshio Osada ends up getting a job at the geology department, but is specifically looking to return to the Bay Area. In December of 1947, he writes to Robert Miller looking for a job in the Bay Area, especially at the academy. He says he's worried about his job, the future of his job, and his wife misses their life in San Francisco. He also said that he had a hard time finding housing, suitable housing, due to redlighting. Um, here's a quote from his letter to Robert Miller. Pasadena is one of the worst places for Japanese and colored people to live, as the zoning rule is so strict that we can find a house only in a small section of the city. And he tells Miller, he also tells Miller, um, that he, I can do almost anything to any department except mechanical science. When I am needed um, in ornithology, I can skin birds, make study skins or mount live birds. For botanists, I can make dried specimens, make drawings and cataloging. For geologists, I will prepare, make drawings, photograph specimens, etc. He's really trying to sell himself as a man of, of many skills. Um, and his options really are pretty limited. He's not a citizen at this time. So even Durham who appreciated uh, Toshio's work could not have him work for him at the University of uh, California, Berkeley um, because um, non-citizens were banned from any civil service jobs. So, um, so, and it does seem like the letter works because Robert Miller finds a role for Toshio and he ends up, um, and Toshio ends up talking to Cecil Toast, who's the preparator and the head of exhibits at the time for about a possible temporary position um, in November of 1948. And then I guess it worked, like it all clipped together. And in nine, December, 1940, um, it, and then shortly afterwards, he's offered a position at the Academy and then something else that, sorry, I kind of jumped the gun there, but um, also shortly at, around this time period in December, uh, Charles Templeton Crocker dies. And in his will, he leaves Toshio $500, which I assume is very, very helpful for a time where he's sort of unclear about where his future is. And sort of this lasting bond between the two of them, even though I'm not sure how much contact they had, but um, just, shows how much of an impression Toshio leaves with people. Um, he's offered a job November 30th, 1948 as the preparator in exhibits um, and it pays $3,000 a year. And it's only a one year appointment that could be renewed. Um, the Academy assures him that he'll get a three month notice in, if it isn't renewed so that he has time to look for another position. Um, but obviously there was no problems with renewing his job because he spends the next 17 years at the academy. Uh, he starts off as an assistant preparator in the exhibits department in March, 1949. And he eventually works his way to assistant curator and then an associate cura curator in 1960. Another exciting development during this time period is that in 1955, Toshio becomes a US citizen. He's 62 years old, and this is 32 years after he first enters the United States. I mean, and this is only possible because of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1950. The act abolished racial restrictions found in the United States Immigration and Natu Naturalization Statutes that went back to the Naturalization Act of 1790. Um, it, this act still retained a quota system for nationalities and reg regions though. Um, so there's, so these are some photos of Toshio. There's so many photos of Toshio, so there will be a lot of them in the next few slides. But the photo on the left is a portrait of Toshio, probably from the 1960s. And then the photos on the right are him working on the African Hall uh, dioramas which he spent a lot of time on. So he, there in the middle is a warthog and there on the right, he's working on some of the birds and the foliage that surround them. So he, um, 
African Annex or African Hall, an expansion of African Hall, which is called African Annex, um, opens in December of 1951. Um, and Toshio was hired just in time to work on this humongous project. Uh, he and Cecil Toros work on most of the mounting of the animals for the expansion. He also, um, Toshio did a lot of work in African Hall in general, which included the rhino, the hippo, he oversaw preparators, worked on all aspects of the diorama, painted murals. Um, and after Cecil Toast passes away in 1958, he takes over taxidermy work. Um, so you can see them um, mounting the water buffalo and it's this very involved process, which I won't go into too much detail because I don't know. There are some uh, other staff members that are experts in this, but um, I just wanted to highlight Toshio's work here and just sort of highlight some of the images that we have. So African Hall sort of evolves over time and changes, there's new additions all the time. So there's a rhinoceros that comes in 1960 and a hippopotamus that comes in 1958. So the photo on the left is the hippopotamus skeleton, oh, sorry, rhinoceros skeleton um, being loaded into a truck and being moved. And then on the right, you can see it's Africa Hall uh, and the water buffalo group sort of last minute or sort of finishing touches being done. Um, and then you can see here's a picture of uh, the annex um, of the hippo and the rhino. And that's a photo from the 90s. So this, um, and then on the right, you can see a photo of Toshio working on the rhino, which is probably around the early 1950s. Um, and also I wanted to say, Toshio was a perfectionist and his craftsmanship has held up over time. Well, all this time. Um, he, he told a journalist that he, there wasn't a secret. He said, one must know nature itself. That's the main thing. And we know that he, Toshio was passionate about nature and knew, and knew nature very well. He spent most of his adult life traveling around the world, observing it. Um, and so here on the left is a, a a taxidermied pangolin that Toshio worked on. Um, and it's the photo on the left is a photo from 2020, just last year. It, um, it's actually held up over time. There's nothing had to be done to display it. Um, and then the photo on the right is from 1972 when it was originally um, probably like very close to when it was originally displayed. And it's, pretty much the same. His mounting job is so excellent. Um, yeah, so we can see like sort of the skill that he has in putting these together and that legacy of his work in the Academy still to this day. So the pangolin was part of the skin exhibit, which closed in January of 2020. So um, yes, and we still have that in our collection to this day. Um, probably right before he retires in 1964, he works on the Hall of Prehistoric Life, which is also known as Fossil Hall. And the main feature was a 17 foot fossil of a giant fish called Portheus mollusus. And it was 80 million years old. Um, and so you can see there's a photo on the left is a photo of the hall in the 1960s. And then the photo on the right is Toshio working on it right before they open the exhibit. But Toshio is a really busy guy. So he doesn't just work in exhibits, he also works with other departments. Um, and he sort of is maybe considered a re the resident artist. He um, works for, he does some work for the planetarium. I, there's a newspaper clipping that says in 1956, four years after the opening of the planetarium, there was a show called Man on Mars, which used a multicolor projector to provide a 360 degree view of the Martian landscape. It was Asayada who painted this Martian desert landscape. Um, I don't have pictures of it, but I do, I hope to find one one day. And then he also um, worked on, which I only found out just recently um, working on this talk is he worked on these title images for a biography called Alice Eastwood's Wonderland, The Adventure of a Botanist by Carol Green, which was published in 1955. It is the biography of Alice Eastwood and it was published by the Academy. And all the little title um, headings were drawn by Toshio. 
And so you can see the title page on the left, and that's Toshio's illustration on the top. And in the author's preface, Carol Green Wilson writes, the pen and floral ink, the pen and ink floral headings drawn by Toshio Sada, the Academy staff, expresses understanding developed during 20 years of friendship with Nina Eastwood. And I had no idea, though I shouldn't have been surprised that they were friends. Um, they definitely had overlap in their tenure. And Alice Eastwood is probably one of our most famous characters from the Academy. And she was the botany curator from 1892 to 1950. Um, and she had died and she died two years uh, in 1953, a few years after retiring. Um, but it's just, I mean, I just feel like Atoshio knew everybody and somehow his connection with the Academy is such so deep. So he also works on Science in Action, um, which is this TV show the Academy produces in 19, starting in 1949. Uh, it features a variety of uh, scientific topics and was host, mostly hosted by the director of the Steinert Aquarium uh, at the time, Earl Harold, and it broadcast on local public stations. Uh, we, so he, we know that he and Cecil worked on some of the sets. You can see in the photo on the left, them working on a set. And then he, he was also, it seems like a guest on some of the shows. Um, so, but unfortunately so far, we haven't seen any of those actual film titles in our collection. So it would be great to see Toshio in action. And the other thing is during this time period, he also exhibits his work. So Toshio, the artist, exhibits his work with the Acad mostly associated with the Academy. Mm -hmm. In 1949, he has a he's part of a temporary exhibit in North America Hall called Off the Beaten Track in the Pacific. It features 22 of 40 different tropical fish species from the Crocker expedition. In 1954, he has a, he's part of a show called Gateway to Nature, which is um, a Sierra Club exhibit. It traveled from the San Francisco Junior Museum, which is now the Randall, um, and then to the Oakland Public Library, and then also uh, was exhibited in Marin County. It included photos by Ed Ross and Robert Orr, who were curators at the Academy, and then also some of Toshio's wood carvings of birds. Um, so yeah, and then in 1961, he was part of a show called World, uh, an academy exhibit called World Beneath the Sea, which included his fish paintings. And in 1962, he was also part of another academy show called Water Life Designs, which included his fish from tropical seas um, paintings and then Color Transparencies by Robert Ames of Marine Animals. So I don't have any photos from any of those exhibits, but I did want to just then show some of Toshio's watercolor. So the, the watercolor on the left, I have, um, it's not a scientific illustration. It doesn't have the same sort of descriptions on the back, but it's part of his collection and it is definitely more artistic. And then the photo of, on the right is um, a watercolor, a beautiful watercolor from the uh, from his 1932 Galapagos expedition. And then he retires in July of 1965. He's 72 years old at this point. Um, and then they, at the Academy has a small retirement party for him. And so here are some photos. On the left is a photo of him with George Lindsay, who's the director of the Academy at the time. And in the middle is a photo with um, John T. Howell, who was on the Galapagos expedition with Asaya Atoshio, and then is the curator Botany at the time. And then on the right is Neil Carson, who's the head of exhibits, and Earl Harold, who's the aquarium director and the host of Science in Action. Um, and then Toshio Asada passes away two years later and um, in March, on March 18th, 1968, he's 74. He had planned to garden in his retirement and visit Japan, possibly at the insistence of his wife. Um, his wife Suzuka does move back to Japan at some point and deposits his personal papers and artwork at the National Museum of Ethnology in Japan, which is how we get a lot of information, biographical information about his life. 
uh, I'm coming to an end now. Um, but I did want to list some uh, resources. So there's a link to the Toshio Asada project by Norio Miwa at the National Museum of Ethnology. And then a link to our just collection guide is just an inventory of our own collection of his watercolor drawings. Um, and I also wanted to take this time for uh, thank yous. Huge, huge, huge thank yous to Norio Niwa, who's the Associate Professor for the Center for Cultural Resource Studies at the National Museum of Ethnology. He has been working on a centralized database of Toshio's artwork and had written a very in-depth, he called short biography, but not um, of Toshio's life. And I relied on that a lot to put this presentation together. He had been, a, he's been able to do a really deep dive into Toshio's life because he's able to access Toshio's writing in Japanese and also like sort of be able to do more research about his early life in Japan. I also want to take this time to uh, uh, thank some academy staff who also helped me put this uh, presentation together. Dave Catania, the ichthyology collection manager who took those snaps of the uh, ichthyology specimens, and then Lindsay Palima, who's the research collections registrar, who knows so much about exhibit history. Um, and she's the one that clued me in on the pangolin and all the work that Toshio had done in Africa Hall. And then also thank you to Molly Nicholson and other Toshio fan, uh, fan club members at the Academy. Their enthusiasm kept me going. And also they did some extra sleuthing on their own and um, clued me in on some of these details of his life. And finally, I wanna thank my family for putting up with my craziness while I put this talk together. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that was incredible. That was, that you really, yeah, I, you really brought him to life and I had no idea he basically, he did so much. I mean, that's, that's just like, what did he not do? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I mean, I learned so much um, putting this talk together and yeah. like discovered little, all these little threads. I feel like we have all these little threads that I was kind of sort of able to put together a little bit. Um, and then his influence at the Academy. I mean, I'm so happy that his pangolin was on exhibit pretty yeah. recently. Yeah, that was really neat. The yeah, the legacy he left there and also in like all these other museums all over the world is is really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But the, it's interesting seeing how you work too as an archivist because you can really like there's such a range of information that's available. So you have like the really high level narrative stuff and then you also, you know, you have the details like and they said that they promised to give him three months heads up. <laughs> changed. And, it's, and I love it actually, because it just kind of shows the range of materials you're working with. And it's just really, really cool. Um, yeah, so I'm in the fan club and I feel like this is the, the best fix I've ever gotten. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks for having me. I know I could yeah. go into so much detail about everything. I really have to hold myself back here. So uh. so we'll, we'll do a three hour expansion pack for yeah, people that really right. want to stick around. Um, we do have some questions. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I just and just I mean, uh, I think part of what was I had no idea that the I mean, of course, like discrimination is always personal, but the degree to which his his work actually got him so specifically in trouble and then how kind of like vehement and awful people got in. I mean, like the, the description that the the person who got him in trouble with the FBI said about treating people like scum is so at odds with every single other description that that we saw that it just really brought home how much hate and just terrible rhetoric was around then. Yeah. And also that he couldn't describe like differentiate him from any other Japanese. Right. That was like a quote in the file. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that really takes you out of the storytelling, right? You're like, so that was terrible. Actually, it was like really terrible. <laughs> like, it was really terrible. Yeah. Also, yeah. that file, I was like so excited to find that file. Like we found it recently um, mm -hmm. and they had misspelled his name. So that's why no one like it was his oh, name wow. was spelled Escada, which is a common problem, I think. Um, but yeah. Wow. So wow. Just. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I know you just talked for 50 straight minutes. So yeah, please feel free to drink your coffee. <laughs> the um, first question that I have is from Krista. And she asked, do we have any sense to what degree Toshio would have been welcomed or not welcomed by other scientists and museum people when he first moved to New York? Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's not clear to me. I mean, he probably was 
I mean, if you see all the photos, he's often alone. He's there are not very many other people of color working yeah. uh, alongside him. Um, so even at the academy, you know, he he's often yeah. the only person of color. Um, so I'm not sure. Also, he didn't. He only has an undergraduate degree, and I don't know how much of that. I don't really know how much of that was held up against him or not. Um, it does seem like we often think of him as an artist, but he was obviously mm -hmm. a scientist as well. Right. I, yeah, I don't know. And it sounds um, like he was still learning English at that time too. So it must have been incredibly isolating and taken just insane amounts of energy and courage. Yeah. And also his uh, mentor at the time goes back to Japan to end up teaching. So it's even though he got his PhD at University of Chicago, so it does not seem like it's an easy place for someone right. I think, here in the United States to make their way in that time period. Right, yeah. Um, Matt asked, can you say a little bit more about why the Zane Gray expedition wasn't as expected? I think there were some financial problems. There was like some, Zane Gray was a little odd and his wife was, I think she didn't want him to overspend on the on the expedition she's like one yacht is enough <laughs> yeah i don't know there's like something uh, there were some personal issues and i think there was some squabbling amongst um some of the staff that came like his the per zane gray's personal secretary and stuff so it just uh i think and you know he i don't really know i think he just liked to fish that was pretty much his primary like yeah. reason for going on this expedition maybe some inspiration for his writing but yeah, it wasn't the same as Templeton Crocker. I mean, who had no problems with money, and then right. also seemed to enjoy um, seemed to enjoy like all this scientific work, like collecting, and had been in in the Navy, so he did have some sailing experience. Right, he enjoyed it as long as he stopped for formal dinner on the hour. yeah. Well, yeah, there's some. I mean, I had to limit myself on photos, but there are these <laughs> pictures of their dinner. It's so nice. It's such a I fancy. Want, I want to see those. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christine asked, um, did Isada have any academic art training? It doesn't seem like it. Um, not that we can tell. I mm -hmm. mean, his degree is in science. Um, and it it seems like he's either self-taught or somehow learned. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, Trisha was curious. When you were talking about Templeton Crocker, she wondered, do you know if it, there's any connection to the Crocker Museum that's in San Sacramento? Probably. I mean, the <laughs> Crockers, I mean, they're one of, I mean, I, I think Crocker, like his grandfather is probably like some people would call them robber barons. You know, they yeah. were like these four people like had this immense amount of wealth. Um, Leland Stanford is another one. So like, yes, I'm sure it's probably related somehow. Yeah. Um, make money and <laughs> make money and multiply. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Alicia was curious, so she asked um, if you know, or do you know, did Cecil Toast pass away prematurely? He looks so much younger than Toshio in photos. Yeah, I'd have to look at my notes. I think he's in his 50s. Yeah, I don't remember exactly why. And maybe um, that's a Lindsay Palaima question, probably. Oh. She probably <laughs> would know. She's the one that like is the one that knows the sort of details of the exhibit history and okay. why Cecil died. Okay. Great. Well, we've had Lindsay on once and I feel like arm <laughs> twisting. It only takes like four months of arm twisting. So I'll start with yeah. you again. Um, and you kind, of, you kind of spoke to this in your thank yous, but Benton wanted to know how much work did you have to do to find all the various materials that pulled this story together? Uh, a lot. I mean... Enough to make your family crazy, it sounds like. Yeah, enough to make... And also this has been a passion, like... Yeah. Laurela says this has been a passion project for a while. There is a fan club at the Academy who had been sort of pulling together some of these resources that exist outside. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then Norio Niwa, who is the one that wrote this like kind of short biography, he actually came to visit, uh, I think is like a year ago. And that sort of spurred me to like do some digging in the National Archives, which is where I uncovered the Department of Justice files, which gives, oh, wow. I mean, it's creepy, but it also gives us a really clear picture of his life. Um, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I just, I know you, it, it's like the, what the person was actually feeling or thinking is the stuff that doesn't make it to paper, but no. I don't know the way that you described it was really powerful still. Um, and then so I'll just use this as the last question from Jonathan. 
Um, and you, so he, he asks, is there a link to a site where all of these amazing images are located? And you gave us some links, which I'll copy into the comments so it's easy to click. Um, but yeah, you always get this question and I know it's a hard one. No, there isn't. Uh, I think Norio is working on the centralized database, which would be great to like kind of consult because I think there are some other images at other museums. Um, and for us, it would be great. Like we are working on it. We are working on trying to put like at least our own images of his um, online in a sort of easy, because yeah, those water, like I showed only a handful, but yeah. there are hundreds of these watercolors that he's done. Um, also some photographs, I mean, so yeah. Yeah, and one you, day. One day, and um, I mentioned this in the YouTube comments, but you and I are in the process of working on something we hope will become a really beautiful digital exhibit within the next handful of months. So we'll, so that's a plug for that. We'll keep people updated. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much again. And I know how much work these are to put together, but uh, you know that we, I always want you back on this show <laughs> as soon as you have time to give me 40 more hours. Um, so thank you. And thank you so much to everybody watching today. I'll do the, the plug for the next program, which is Tuesday, February 23rd. Um, we're going to have a really special panel with three of the founders of Black and Entomology, um, all really incredible women. So come back for that. And then as always, um, we would love to ask for your support. We are now in our 12th month of closure. And if you're able to give any amount at all, we'd be deeply grateful. There is a, I'll drop a link to the Academy Resilience Fund in comments, but there's a donate button on Facebook and there is in the description on YouTube. So thank you for any support there. And Rebecca, thank you once more. And um, yeah, I'll make you come back again less than six months. <laughs> right, anytime, Laurel. This has been okay. great. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, it's incredible.